So firstly, a big thank you uh, to everyone for joining us today. Um, I know those of you based in the UK uh, having a short week this week, it's a busy one. Um, and so really appreciate you taking the time. Um, so today we're here to talk about content and social strategy, um, and in particular how this has changed in recent times. Um, my name is Ruth Faulkner. I'm an account director at Tonic Agency and also our head of content. Um, and really, we just want to take you through some thoughts, myself and Steph, today. So firstly, probably introductions to Tonic. Uh, I think a lot of you on the call have come across us previously, but for those of you who haven't, uh, we're a creative agency based in London, but operating globally with big global clients. And we focus on um, anything to do with people, really, whether that's your talent brand, your recruitment marketing, internal comms, um, how you create lovely work that engages with um, people, whether that's kind of candidates or, or employees. Um, and really our, our core ethos is creating wonderful work that works. So uh, stuff that looks beautiful, but that's also kind of truly effective. And that's what we really care about. Um, but with my kind of content hat on today, it's probably useful that uh, I take you a bit further back than the, my time at Tonic and um, look a bit at the kind of journey I've been on. So actually, I started out as a trained journalist. Um, I was lucky enough to, to write for a few big publications. Um, but a really kind of exciting period for me was being able to work at the London Olympics in 2012 as a reporter. Um, and at that time, I was reporting not only kind of news content, but also doing videos for YouTube, uh, kind of social posts uh, live on our social media. Um, and it really got me hooked on the kind of range of content and the, the, the varieties of ways that you could share stories. Um, I got to then continue that in Rio 2016, leading an editorial team out there um, and also launching kind of the first ever live Twitter service of this editorial team. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I kind of made my foray into uh, employer brand and, and people coming back into London and working with Accenture in their global team. Um, so putting out content around the world that uh, really interests and engages uh, either employees or, co or candidates. Um, and that was a great experience. That's a bit of me up to here. Um, Steph, it would be lovely if you could introduce yourself as well. Yeah, hi. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the head of social over at Tonic. And social has just been something that got me right at the start. So some of you may remember myspace.com, one of the very early social networking sites. And I latched onto that super quick and I was really excited by it and had a very active blog on that platform where I'd share funny stuff that I found around the internet. And generally it was things like viral videos because, you know, YouTube wasn't really a big thing back then. So um, someone at MySpace reached out to me and said, we love your blog. Can we feature you on the homepage? Which essentially meant anyone logging in to myspace.com that day would see this <laughs> picture of me front and center with a link to my blog. And that's when I realized it was someone's job to curate exactly what content goes on that front page. And that's when I thought, oh, maybe there's a job for me in social media. And so my journey began. And come 2012, I was working as a moderator for a lot of big companies. But I think my most exciting job was when I was working for Alicia Keys, in a way. Uh, she had a activation as part of her USA tour, where she invited fans in cities where she'd be playing to send her a photo, and a selection of photos would be chosen to be projected during that concert. So the photos all got sent online, and it was my job to look at the photos and say, yes, shortlist it or no, reject it, based on very simple things like whether a gentleman had a t-shirt on or not. There are such rules as those. <laughs> and then skip forward another few years, and I spent a lot of time working client-side for consumer brands called GiftGap. It's a mobile phone network in the UK, and they bought a very big television sponsorship. So as part of uh, Nationwide Channel, Channel 4, uh, they sponsored 
several entertainment shows and I helped GIFGAF find a way to start conversations with their phone network users about the television shows that they loved on Twitter. And then we would take some of uh, the most interesting or exciting tweets and actually put them into a sponsorship message that was played out live on TV before their favorite show started. And after working consumer side for a little while, I felt a new challenge was due and I was drawn to the world of employer brand. And I love it because you're connecting people with jobs and jobs with the right people. And it's a whole other set of challenges and it's so wholesome. There's nothing quite like seeing that perfect match come together of candidate and role. So that's a little about me. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's us. Um, but what are we here to talk about today? Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of the elephant in the room of every conversation right now. But uh, yes, the world has changed uh, very quickly, actually. Um, in the UK, I'd say it's probably the last eight weeks or so, we've gone through massive, massive change. Um, and understandably, we've all been responding and dealing with that in our own ways. Um, and for kind of many of our, our clients and our friends and, and big businesses that we're working with, we're seeing that often that's kind of waiting and seeing what's happening. That might be um, kind of stepping back from some of the normal comms that are putting out and kind of just taking a moment to, to adjust in this period. Um, but as the uh, kind of pandemic and the, the crisis is moving on as um, your audiences are moving on actually we think now's the time to kind of stop that that holding pattern and actually we can't wait around much longer we need to get to a new normal um, get to a place where you can keep kind of connecting with your target audiences where you can keep your talent brand alive even thriving um, where you can set the stage for, for rebirth and growth after this and really kind of lay the groundwork for how you're going to work going forward. So that's our kind of call to arms today is let's all kind of draw the line here and, and reset and, and get to a place that we can work together going forward. But before I kind of dig into to that content, actually, it's lovely to hear a little bit about what's going on in, in your worlds um, before we, we kind of talk about us and, and what we've seen. So could you all please go to menti.com and use the code 446241. It should be quite easy to spot. And while you do that, I'm just going to get uh, your kind of results up on screen. So we should be able to see live. So. Hopefully, if you're at menti.com and you've put in that code there, 446241, you'll be able to see an option to uh, answer to this question. And what I want to know is kind of how active have you been on social media during the period of this crisis? What, whatever period that's been for your own market. Um, so you can select that and do make sure you click submit so that we get your results up here on screen. Um, and I'll just give you a minute to, to have a think about the question and to uh, answer there. It's going up and down a bit between being kind of super active or being a bit quieter. I'm heartened to see actually that, that nobody's on the calls yet voted that they've gone dark. Um, but obviously if you have, there's really no judgment because it's been such an insane time. It's about what we do going forward now. I'll just wait for a couple more people to post. I think there's probably a few more people coming through. And for those who may not have spotted it, there is a little submit button on the bottom of the Menti page. So make sure you click that too. Okay, I'm going to leave that there, I think. Um, we do have a clear run out winner. I'm hoping you're not just clicking because you like Batman and Robin. Um, <laughs> but actually, you know, if, if the majority of you on um, the call today have been kind of pretty active on social during this time, that's great um, and kind of sets us up well for continuing this conversation. Um, I can just see something in the chat. Um, sorry, what's the code again? If you submit 4462. Four, one. Hopefully you can see it at the top of my screen there, but uh, perhaps if you're dialing on the phone, it's not possible to see. So it's four, four, six, two, four, one.
me just give that person a minute to submit their answers. There we go. So another um, kind of active poster. That's brilliant. So then my next question is about how active you've been with your candidates. So uh, people that you're kind of hiring into to join the company. So are you, have you been hiring through this period? Have you been kind of setting up for a future pipeline? Um, have you been a bit quiet and, and not engaging? So which of the, the three are you kind of sitting at here? A few happy people still hiring, that's nice. Yeah, it's a great position to be in. And understandably, they're um, in the middle of someone kind of building out their future pipeline. I think it's a great time to be able to do that. And those of you not engaging with candidates at the moment, you're not alone. Um, part of the reason for asking this question is that a lot of clients in this period actually been kind of stepping back from that engagement, but we're looking at how we move forward from that now. Cool, so I think this is about as many in the last question. So just one last question and then you guys get to, to go back to listening. Um, so has your kind of social content strategy adjusted, changed, been reset in response to the current crisis? Yeah, think about the there. things you've you've been posting to your timeline recently. Are they the things that you might have planned in early March? Or were you finding that actually some of the things you planned needed to change? You know, maybe one post wasn't quite right, so you swapped that out and put something else in. Right. Well, I think that's the majority of people that have been answering throughout and that's quite clear that most of you have seen that you've had to adjust your plans in response to the crisis which I don't think is um is surprising there um any final responses I'll give you a minute and then I'll switch back to the other presentation you can tell that I have a preference for um joke uh videos and dogs and cats can't you Okay, so that was really interesting and kind of thank you for, for sharing your experiences because um, obviously Steph and I get to speak to our clients day in, day out, but um, it's interesting to hear from kind of the majority of you how you've been responding with social and content in this time. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Steph for a bit now and then we're gonna kind of swap out between us. Yeah, well, I think the sheer volume of you all that have adjusted your plans in response to the crisis just goes to show that business as usual has changed. And we've been listening to many messages from our clients about what that means for them. And there's just some examples here. So for some of our clients, they're used to preparing a one month content calendar for all their social media posts, but actually sometimes the feeling has been that actually that entire plan is not right anymore. And so rather than post any of it, they would just stop and take stock and find out where everything's going to settle around them. And when business starts to feel a bit more stable, then maybe they'll start posting again. We've got some clients that have had many open roles, lots of volume higher roles, in fact, but suddenly there's been a recruitment freeze and Thankfully, for many of you voting, we saw that you still had open roles to recruit for, but we realized that's not the case for everyone. For some, there's a total freeze. We've got some clients who have dedicated content resource in-house. You know, some are making photos in-house and going out and sourcing things that can be shared online. Others have a dedicated social media manager. So someone that is not just making the content, but they're also scheduling it in and making sure those posts go out. And again, some clients have seen that that resource has been furloughed, meaning that there isn't anyone on hand to man the social media channels. And some of our clients have gone from having lots of news to share, you know, very active businesses with lots of new products coming out and different ways that they're servicing customers but suddenly business has been closed temporarily uh, often due to government guidance or world health organization guidance so they've gone from having this 
great pipeline of stories and big events that are about to take place to suddenly not having that news to share. So the question becomes, well, what do we share? What do we talk about? And of course, given the feeling in the air, and I think we're, we're all human, we've all felt it, we've seen the news, we've seen the panic, we've seen um, all the questions being asked, all the uncertainty, because of that, uh, I don't know how to quite describe it other than unstable environment, people are not very confident and not very confident in getting the messaging that they post to social rights. And understandably so, to be honest. I mean, there's a couple of examples here of brands that have got it wrong. The first one is Argos, who, if you're not familiar with them, are a high tail, re high tail, high street retailer uh, in the UK. And they sell all sorts of uh, all sorts of goods, really, everything from jewellery through to lawn mowers. And they were trying to be helpful at the start of the crisis. So on the 23rd of March, when the UK government said all non-essential stores should close, they posted this one post to LinkedIn that announced that although their, their standalone stores would close, the online shop remains open and customers can still go to their um, shop within a shop outlet. So there's a supermarket called Sainsbury's that sometimes has a Argos shop within it. So that would stay open. So they're trying to do the right thing, trying to educate the customers as to where they can still go about their business, but it wasn't quite the right message. They had responses from other customers asking, well, why are you putting your employees at risk? Because there was no message around what would change for their employees, how Argos would be protecting them and keeping them safe. To the degree where people were commenting, you know, pure greed and no need on this post, which isn't the kind of brand sentiment that you want to be driving. And then we've also seen comments from people in the supply chain here. We've got a driver who is really confused about what his role is amongst the crisis right now. And he's unclear whether Argos really should be his priority at the moment or whether he should be driving for the NHS instead. So this message didn't go quite right. And m part of the reason it didn't go quite right was the tone as well. But there are other brands that have definitely struck the wrong chord with their tone. There's McDonald's who in Brazil socially distanced their arches, which is a nice novelty PR stunt, but doesn't really tell you anything about what McDonald's really are doing to socially distance their colleagues or to socially distance customers. So to this individual retweeting it, pulling the logo apart didn't really mean anything. There was no message there for him. There's also this post from Burger King. And um, interestingly, they took a very similar approach in South Africa, where this post is from and in the UK. In both regions, they posted bye for now. And their audience felt this was incredibly over the top. It felt very grand to be saying goodbye as though they were closing the curtains and vanishing behind this smoke and mirrors and would never be seen again. So the customers felt abandoned almost as though this was a bit of an easy way out for Burger King to say, right, okay, we're off now, bye. When really they wanted Burger King to step up and say, oh, okay, we have to close our stores for now to keep everybody safe, well, restaurants. We get that, so here's what we'll do instead, or here's what we'll do next, but that was missing, and instead they just got a goodbye. So naturally, we have been a bit hesitant about what to post and been you know, asking questions over and over again. Is this the right thing? Is this what the audience want to hear? Do they want to hear from us right now? And actually, the answer is yes. The audience definitely do want to hear from you right now. And I'm sure those of you that have been posting regularly have seen this too. The folks are spending 38% more time on social media since the start of April. And this is globally, not just in the UK. 39% are spending more time on messaging services. And that makes sense. You're keeping in touch with friends and family the only way that you can online. And 31% are watching more online videos. And I think it's fairly likely every one of us will have seen a meme about Tiger King on Netflix at some point. That's just one example of that phenomenon of online video streaming that's happening right now. 
So the audience are there, they're consuming content and they expect to hear from you. They expect to hear how you're being helpful and that's helpful not just to customers, to colleagues, but also to the community. And certainly for our clients, we've seen posts that have communicated messages about how the client is supporting a local charity, the local community, or even the NHS and key workers. These posts have been received phenomenally well. Audiences expect you to tell them what you're doing to face the situation. So calling back to that Burger King post and the McDonald's post, they didn't really say what they were going to do. And that's exactly what your audience want to hear, what you are going to do, what actions you're taking, what's coming next, what's happening behind the scenes. And all of this should be wrapped up in a reassuring tone. So the audience have been looking for guidance in amongst all the chaos. They just want a calm voice that will say, it's okay. We've got this. But what you certainly shouldn't do right now is be exploiting the situation to promote brand or products. Um, this is this is something that can be quite distasteful if done if done wrong. Um, there is a famous example of a brand who uh, and again, this is distasteful, so I feel awkward telling the story, but they capitalized or attempted to capitalize on Carrie Fisher's passing. And Carrie Fisher famously played Princess Leia in Star Wars by posting a sad message, RIP Carrie Fisher, a picture of Princess Leia with the famous hairstyle, and then somehow managing to connect this to and so you should buy our cinnamon rolls because they're like her hairstyle and it's some kind of nice tribute to Carrie Fisher. Needless to say, that post didn't go down very well and that brand suffered a lot of terrible brand PR as a result. So there's a similar sense around the coronavirus pandemic. We shouldn't be going down the, the line of coronavirus has pulled us all apart from one another. So buy a Coke and let's get closer together. It just is insensitive. And so that naturally is not what people want to hear from you. But the good thing is we're starting, at least in the UK, to come back out the other side of the global pandemic. And different countries are at different stages in the journey through the crisis. So um, where we are in the UK may not necessarily align with where you are, but some of this may feel like it's true of a moment that's just passed or can prepare you for actually what's coming up around the corner. So for, th for those of you that have pulled back on posting, actually now's a really good time to start getting your content back out there. Test and learn from it. Purposefully try different messages and see which ones your audience respond best to. And social's brilliant because it's so fast. People will tell you very quickly when they like something. So listen to them and keep an eye on what's happening. If you are in a recruitment freeze right now, and I think there was just one of you on this webinar that mentioned they were, actually, you know, you've still got colleagues working for you and you do still have candidates that you will need to keep warm because at some point, recruitment will reopen again. And wouldn't it be brilliant if you already had a line of people waiting for that moment that the door opens? And if your in-house resource is furloughed, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop because if you have the keys to the channels and you can access them, wouldn't it be nice if you could keep the lights on for your colleague when they got back home? So when they get back to their desk and they open all the social channels, actually some things have been going out and the content drumbeat's been kept alive. And even if business is temporarily closed, you'll be preparing to reopen. There'll be an incredible amount of work happening behind the scenes to get you ready for that stage where you can welcome the public in again. Or if you're working in a sector that doesn't have that face-to-face -face interaction with customers, you will be preparing to go back to um, a more familiar way of working. So there are still things that are happening it's just that they're not the same as they were a couple of months ago so there's a shift in perspective that you can make around what your business activity is so to get there we think that well we recommend that you focus on 
employee content that's content made by employees and for employees that's your current colleagues people that work for you right now taking responsibility so that's your business stepping up and saying we understand that coronavirus has impacted us all here's what we are doing to help our colleagues and also help our customers and offer your unique perspective. There'll be something that your company can do, can offer that others can't. And that's really where the magic of your brand starts to be sprinkled in amongst all of your content. To bring this to life, we've got a couple of examples. And the first one is from Lloyds Bank. They're a high street bank in the UK. And they've ticked all of these boxes. Their employee content is a beautiful video of two individuals filming themselves from home but they're having a conversation and rather than just you know screen record a chat through Microsoft Teams or Zoom and then share the screen recording this video has had a little bit of that branding magic applied to it to give it a bit more visual oomph give it a bit more of a draw for the viewer they've even just tilted the videos in slightly so these two individuals look like they're facing one another it's these subtle touches that just make it feel that little bit more down to earth. And these two individuals are talking about mental health as part of Mental Health Awareness Week. And following on nicely from this, Lloyds Bank posted how they were taking responsibility in this area. They were going to offer the Headspace app, which is norm normally subscription only, for free to all of their colleagues. And this app will support with mindfulness and uh, guided meditations to help people with their mental health. And their unique perspective was Lloyds Bank being able to offer numbers, information, statistics on how they are responding to the crisis and how they are changing things for customers, but also for colleagues. And another example here is from Boots. And Boots are another retailer, another, and you can find them again on the UK High Street. They have in-store pharmacies, meaning that people can visit a Boots store and pick up a prescription, but you can also pick up you know, a sandwich or toiletries or other things that you might need. So their employee content takes a static image, but shows how employees are adapting their day-to-day -to, -day to the current circumstances. So here we've got two individuals, one's wearing a face shield, the visor, the other is wearing a mask but they still look very happy. I think the beauty is seeing a smile through that transparent visor. You know, sometimes when the mask's hiding half of somebody's face, it's hard to get a sense of emotion from them. But the combination of a smile and that pose in the background makes it feel like Boots employees are still having fun, they're still enjoying work. It's just that they've changed how they're going about it. In taking responsibility, Boots called out very early on that they were one of the first retailers in the UK to purchase protective visors for our colleagues. Because they had an in-store pharmacy and offered medication, they needed to stay open when all other non-essential businesses were closing, which meant that they really needed to find a way through all of this before anyone else did. And I think that's one of the um, advantages that retailers reopening now have, because they can follow the lead of what Boots did. But Boots had to act quickly. And not only did they act quickly, but they told people what they were doing. And finally, their unique perspective was just around additional services they were able to offer in response to their customers and the public's need. So we all, I believe, understand that when people are in lockdown, those that suffer domestic abuse are at high risk of that abuse escalating and when you're in lockdown there's nowhere else to go other than home so boots opened up their consultation rooms as a safe space a place where people could go and it's an essential out uh, an essential store so they didn't feel like they were at risk of going to a boot store and they could speak to somebody one-to-one -one and get that support that they need get that assistance and find themselves back in a place of safety. So we've got this great strategy now of how, how, how companies have responded, how our clients have responded, but we know that times 
continue to change. They're still changing. And we need to start taking these bits that have worked from the immediate response and transform them more into a long-term strategy. And Ruth, I think you've got some great ideas for how we can do that. Yeah. Um, so like Steph said, we've seen what's been happening over the last eight weeks or so in the UK. We've seen how brands have been responding. We've seen where it's gone wrong for them. We've seen where it's um, where they've kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, but really, how do you go from here? So if we're saying we'll draw a line and set a new strategy that's going to take us into a place of kind of growth um, and success, how do you start that? Um, and one thing that might be on your mind is even now it, it we're not at a point of finish things keep changing um it's not static it's not necessarily clear what's happening at any given point um and so there's this need to be kind of responsive and flexible but i think in these changing circumstances one of the things that's really important is to be quite clear and consistent and understanding uh, or understandable in your message um, it's a little bit of a joke there about our British uh, um, kind of leader in this time and clarity of message there. But I think that's a kind of key message to take is yes, we get that things are changing, but you can still keep a, um, a clarity of tone throughout. Um, but also remember, it's not just changing at a government level or a WHO guidance level or at your business level, but the way that your candidates and your employees are feeling is changing all the time as well. Um, this poll here from, from YouGov tracking emotions over this period, I think is quite interesting because you can see big kind of dips and spikes coming back up, um, happiness going down quite drastically there, um, kind of boredom going down and then back up again, frustration wiggling around. It, it's just that we keep kind of responding and, and changing with this. Um, I heard someone call it today, Corona roller coaster. And it's like, yeah, okay, I get that. That's how it feels. Um, so I think that's why it's even more important to, to keep in mind some of the kind of social listening that Steph's alluded to previously, because you've got to be aware about how people are feeling at any given time and keep in mind your tone um, as you're addressing that. Um, but what is clear is that your audience will want to see you care. I think it was really interesting timing for Facebook to bring out their care emoji, because I think that's what we all want to feel at the moment is a little bit of care. And that's what we want to see from others and brands who are seen to exploit it, as Steph mentioned, are seen as uncaring in this time. So practically in terms of the strategy, I think it's really about staying flexible now. Um, and it might sound a bit counterintuitive to say set a long term strategy of being flexible, but it's, it's something you can do. So if anyone's seen me present on content previously, you might recognize the circle on the left hand side here. And that's how we would normally kind of come at content. So looking at audit and assessment first, creating a strategy and a plan, and, and that could be a long term plan going into cycles of creation um, and actually maybe batch creating stuff so you've got efficiencies of scale. Um, and then measure and optimize and learn from that and kind of start the cycle again. So it's an ongoing circle. At the moment, there's not enough time to uh, really de delve deep into each of those kind of quadrants of the circle. And actually the strategy we'd recommend is looking more like the kind of roller coaster that I've referenced earlier. Um, because you have to be very kind of quick and responsive. So yes, you do need to start with a bit of an audit and a strategy. So if you've been posting the last kind of eight weeks or so, what hasn't worked? What do you need to know that isn't going to work with your audience? Uh, what's been working really well and you can do more of? Um, and what's your kind of business objectives and aims? Those should be at the core of your strategy. But you want to kind of build that quite quickly um, and get into a point where you're creating against that so that you can be posting out and then listening as, as kind of as soon as possible um, because you want to listen to how people are responding to your social posts whether that's your internal employees um, how they're engaging and sharing and picking up your content and amplifying it or the external audience and you'd see their engagement rates on your social media kind of measuring tools um, and then take all that listening back in and have a point to reassess. Um, so at that reassessment point, you want to look at all of your social listening, 
but also look at the world around you and what's changed because it is changing so quickly. So you might need to look at the news and what's going on at a government level or WHO level or an advice um, in general about what's going on with the world, but you also might need to look at the business. So uh, how your business uh, strategy is changing. Uh, Twitter, for example, just announced that they were gonna have everyone work from home. It's a change in business strategy that will have long-term implications. So making sure that as these things evolve, you're weaving them into your content. So really your content can't ever be static. Um, at the moment, you want to be getting stuff out as quickly as possible, posting and then listening to your audience and weaving that listening in with what's going on in the world around you so that you can be responding to change. And thinking back to my kind of journalism days, actually this is a newsroom approach. Um, this is kind of responsive creation. This is looking at what's in the world and getting out content around it. Um, and so I think it, it's what we're recommending to clients at the moment is pulling together teams that you can address content on a regular basis and re-plan and re-strategize. So this might be kind of an editorial committee. So I would include people that are in your improve, approval loops in this. So to um, speed up your approval time, have those people that are going to sign off from brand or from corporate comms, try and have them at the table with you and be part of the process if you can. Um, the people that would be signing off from your talent brand or your internal comms. So have a small cluster of people that can make decisions quickly and kind of respond quickly. Um, but also pull in those learnings that I've mentioned. So pull in your social listening, pull in the news and business approach. Um, and then the final thing I think to pull in is, is almost most important. It's kind of getting your content from your employees. So as Steph mentioned, one of the, the core things that we think works now is actually content from and for employees. Um, and you can be asking your employees to send in their uh, kind of user generated mobile phone at home style content submissions over the course of this period and be reviewing them in your kind of newsroom committee sessions. Um, so this gives you regular churn of new content that you can consider as well as looking at the kind of strategy and how you need to reassess. Um, you know, this could be down to every other week we've discussed with some clients so that you're very responsive. If you're putting out a lot of content, you might want to have to do that quicker. Um, if you're posting less regularly, maybe it's once a month, but it's just taking that time to go, we're going to reassess and we understand that, that it's not constant. Um, there may be periods outside of that uh, committee time where you have to change even quicker than that. There may be a big announcement that you need to respond to, but it's just putting in some form of um, plan or strategy that allows you to take that flexible approach and um, create a quick kind of response creation cycle. So just to kind of reiterate the bits of content we think works in that, like I said, employee content, we're so lucky in our roles as talent brand um, or internal comms or recruitment marketing, whatever your role is now, we're so lucky that we've got that kind of tap into employees because um, any story is really only as good as its characters. And for businesses, that's our employees. Um, and telling their story is such a great opportunity. Um, it really brings to life your community. And it doesn't need to be complicated at all. So actually on the screen, the favorite, my favorite one of these is kind of just the post of the sourdough at the end, um, not just because I love bread, but also because it feels kind of real and sweet and tender and heartfelt. This, this is kind of taking it down to the absolute basics, but you can create content very quickly and very easily, um, even in these scenarios. And then looking at taking responsibility in a unique perspective, um, I think this is where you would be most feeding in the business and the news aspect of what's going on into your content plans. So knowing what's going on in the world and thinking about how your audience is feeling, that's when you know what points you should be taking responsibility on. If you're reopening stores, for example, you should be taking responsibility about how your employees are safe and you should be talking about that so that people are aware of that, so that you don't fall into the trap that we saw that Argos did. Um, and then the unique perspective, I think this is really important because of the new, the kind of noise out there right now. Actually, 
a lot of people are talking, a lot of people are talking about what they're doing in response to coronavirus. Um, the audience is listening, as Steph said, but it's kind of hard to hear the, the good stuff through all the noise. Um, and as a business, you don't want to be saying the standard things that anyone else could be saying. You want to be saying the things that you and only you could add to that conversation. Um, so I think those newsroom sessions is really an opportunity to look at where you've got something unique to add to the conversation. And um, I wanted to give video kind of a special mention here because uh, as we saw with the kind of social stats, it is even more important right now. More people are consuming video. The uh, graph on the right there actually shows how people are spending their time and video, um, not only long form, which I assume is more like movies, but actually short form video is right at the top of that oversleep, which I thought was kind of confusing. Um, but everyone is kind of taking in content right now. And I think video is uh, really important to do it that way. Um, but with your video content, you want to make sure that it is reflective of what people are experiencing. And this is why I think user generated video content is landing really well now. So I've been a fan of it for a while. I think it's great for talent brand and it's great for talking about your um, people and telling their stories. But right now, a big um, high level production may not quite land the way you want it to. And when you think about tone and you think about trying to be human and real and considerate of people's emotion, actually having your people speak for themselves through user generated content is the best way of making sure you get that tone right. It's the best way of making feel, sure it feels um, human and reflective of your people. Um, so then that also means you can create quicker. So if you're getting mobile phone video submissions in from your kind of colleagues on a regular basis, you can very quickly kind of edit those and churn them out. Um, and it helps with that quick creation process. Um, but one thing I'd kind of advise, I, I did a lot of this in my time um, at Accenture receiving kind of global UGC submissions, um, is make sure you brief the people up front on exactly what you want, otherwise you'll get all sorts of things. Um, and I think the most important thing is to be very clear on what you want them to shoot, the point that you want them to say, um, even down to kind of individual shots. So you want them to introduce themselves in the first shot. You then want them to walk around their home office and their desk and show you the environment that they're working in. The third shot might be talking about their role and how that's changed in the period of lockdown. And the fourth shot might be them saying what they've learned and how they're looking forward to the future. You can very quickly actually stitch a really nice video together with that. Um, and it, it can be done quite simply and come across as really genuine. So outside of UGC, the other thing that we're looking at and doing a lot with clients is uh, kind of graphics and animation and videos. So um, a different option for this, we received a lot of quotes from one of our clients and actually were able to very quickly put these out into graphics. So it still has that human voice, um, but in a slightly different format. So I think video is something that you need to kind of embed into your strategy, but think about how you can do it in a quick and flexible and responsive way. So I'd say time's up. So not only for our webinar today, but um, thinking about your audience. So then if you are going quiet, and I'm so glad to hear that a lot of you aren't, um, but those brands that have gone quiet, their audience won't wait around forever. Um, and doing kind of just enough or uh, doing bits of social and content when you have the opportunity is actually the biggest risk because you stand the, the possibility that you're gonna get the tone wrong or you're going to post something that's not at the right time, post something that's not for, right for your market, uh, not kind of stepping back to make content and social priority and not setting a strategy around that uh, is posing kind of a brand risk for you in the long term. Um, and obviously my biggest point here is really about being flexible and responsive, but there's no point just saying you're going to be flexible and responsive. You want to set up a plan for how you're practically going to do that. And Steph, I don't know if you've had any final points onto that as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly add that right now in the UK amongst our clients, we're seeing that employees are wanting to help more than ever. Um, some of them have got more 
time on their hands and so more time to offer and they want to do something with that that will help the business and that help their colleagues as well it's that wonderful sense of community that we've seen you know just outside our front doors but it's also spilled through into the workplace so we're finding that where we share content around um how how colleagues are banding together to try doing something in a new way other colleagues are responding to that in the comments and in the reactions extremely positively and we're also finding that when we make an ask of one of our clients colleagues so you know create a photograph or a video and submit it to us more people than ever are getting involved with that because again they want to help they want to do something to um contribute good in this crazy situation so now is a really good time to start making those asks start building relationships with your employees and your colleagues find out who amongst them all is really good at making content because in my experience quite often it's the quiet ones that are also really good at photography or can actually switch it on and make a really really good video they just never felt bold enough to offer their services up so Ask now and you can reap the benefits for months to come, not just in the immediate future. Yeah, absolutely. So I think to, to summarize, there's, there's an incredible opportunity right now and we're feeling this kind of build with our clients. Um, we're feeling people kind of look ahead to what's happening next um, and your employees and your candidates will be feeling this too. So just make sure you're, you're taking this moment to engage with them. So um, opening up to you guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts and considerations um, or any questions or comments. So uh, you would have all been muted on entry, but you're able to unmute and shout out if you want, or you can post questions in the chat. If anyone's got anything to say, we're, we're here to chat. I could quite happily fill some time, Ruth. I'd like to know <laughs> what you recommend when, of course, a client can't easily set up a video shoot so um, you've talked about user generated content but what does that mean to somebody that's quite used to bringing in a camera crew and filming in the workplace yeah absolutely um it's quite interesting i, I saw something the other day uh with a professional film crew you setting up from a social distance point of view so actually using um, a mixture of kind of perspex screens and uh, those face visors that we've seen to do uh, a film sh uh, shoot in a physical way. Um, that is possible if you're really kind of gunning for the high production value. Um, and there are a lot of crews that are looking at how they respond um, right now. I, I do think that, you know, a mixture of things like that with the user generated content is always going to work. And what tends to worry people about UGC is um, the kind of brand production state, like the worry that it's going to look um, unprofessional or uh, not at the high standards that people are used to. Um, but I think, as you showed with Lloyd's Banking Group, there's a lot you can do to take some pure video from someone's mobile phone, for example, and give it a lift. Um, and there's a lot you can do to make sure that you add your brand in. Um, so yeah, there are options for those kind of in-person production shoots if needed. And there are crews that are responding to those briefs and, and we're working with them as well at Tonic. Um, but I still, I'm going to keep harping on about UGC, I'm afraid. Any other questions at all? And I'm afraid I can't see the chat. So Steph, if you see anything, give me a shout. Yeah, I've got the chat open. I mean, unfortunately, I couldn't see the, the message earlier about the Menti code. So it may be that I'm seeing restricted messages as well. So um by all means if anyone's got a question you could use the reactions feature to just give us a thumbs up and then we can call you out or just unmute yourself and, and drop us a line the traditional way <laughs> <laughs> well i think um given that then we'll, we'll let you all go it's nice to put some time back in diaries i know that we all appreciate that um if you do have any questions after this you can get in touch but also um, we'd like to kind of offer one-on-ones um, -on -ones with myself and Steph. Uh, we call them kind of diagnostic sessions, but what we really mean by that is come with a problem and we'll chat through it. 
Um, so whether that's we could get together a group and all work together to solve um, a problem or kind of one-on-one -on -one individual deep dives, that's totally fine. If that's of interest, you can just scan the QR code on screen, just use your phone camera and it should pop up with a click to go through to a form and then you can drop us a note and we'll set that up. Um, but also you should all have my email address off the webinar anyway, so you can get in touch if you have any questions or concerns or if you want to talk anything free.